Good morning and welcome to worship at the First Congregational United Church of Christ in Hendersonville, North Carolina. I'm the Reverend Carla Miller and I am the pastor of this beautiful congregation that seeks to love mercy, walk humbly with God and do justice as best as we are able. Today in Worship in the Sanctuary, we will welcome five new members into the life of this congregation. What an honor and delight to do so. Today also is the beginning of our National Church's General Synod, the United Church of Christ. If you would like to follow the business of our National Church, you can log on to www ucc.org, where you will be able to watch some of the corporate worship and some of the discussions that are happening. It is a wonderful opportunity to see our church in action as it seeks to love God in this world. Let's now take a moment and center our hearts and minds for worship. Holy One, be with us now. Center our hearts, calm our minds so that we might be open to a new word and new experience of you this morning. Amen. Come and let us worship God together. The contemporary reading today is Holiness by Helder Camera. There is no single definition of holiness. 
There are dozens, hundreds, but there is one I am particularly fond of. Being holy means getting up immediately every time you fall with humility and joy. It doesn't mean never falling into sin. It means being able to say, yes, God, I have fallen a thousand times, but thanks to you, I've got up again a thousand and one times. That's all. I like thinking about that. Our scripture reading today is from Amos 7, 7 through 15. This is what God showed me. God was standing beside a wall built with a plumb line, with a plumb line in God's hand. And God said to me, Amos, what do you see? And I said, a plumb line. Then God said, see, I am setting a plumb line in the midst of my people Israel. I will never again pass them by. The high places of Isaac shall be made desolate and the sanctuaries of Israel shall be laid waste and I will rise against the house of Jeroboam with the sword. Then Amaziah, the priest of Bethel, sent a message to King Jeroboam of Israel, saying, Amos has conspired against you in the very center of the house of Israel. The land is not able to bear all his words. For thus Amos has said, Jeroboam shall die by the sword, and Israel must go into exile away from his land. And Amaziah said to Amos, O seer, go, flee away to the land of Judah, earn your bread there, and prophesy there. But never again prophesy at Bethel, for it is the king's sanctuary, and it is a temple of the kingdom. Then Amos answered Amaziah, I am no prophet, nor a prophet's child, but I am a herdsman and a dresser of sycamore trees. And God took me from following the flock, and God said to me, Go, prophesy to my people, Israel. You probably know Bob Vila as the host of the original home improvement show, This Old House, on public TV, back in the day before there was even HGTV. Personally, for years, I thought Bob Vila was simply a, a fictional character on the sitcom Home Improvement starring Tim Allen. I didn't know he was a real person until I saw him on a commercial for Home Depot. Anyway, sparked by the reading from Amos, I was curious to know if plumb lines were still a thing of measurement in construction. So I asked Bob, of course, by Google. I was actually surprised to know this ancient tool of the eighth century BCE is still useful in the 21st century. Indeed, plumb lines are so useful that Mr. Vila suggests that every home toolbox should contain a small one. The plumb bob, Mr. Bob notes, is useful in establishing vertical for a wall in construction or a door jam when hanging a door or you can locate fixtures or decorations in relation to an object or surface below or above using the plumb line. 
Now, since I am certain that I will never be hanging my own doors ever anywhere, I am grateful that I don't really need to understand what he just said. However, knowing that the plumb line is used to make sure something like a wall, a chimney, a fixture is straight, true, and centered by measuring against something that is already plumb is helpful to know. Walls that are plumb will not collapse. Fixtures that are plumb are balanced. I will place a plumb line in the midst of my people, God says to Amos in a vision. The plumb line image suggests God is going to measure Israel's communal behavior and actions against the wall of covenantal promises they have made with the holy, promises of justice, compassion, and mercy. Now, the book of Amos is a consistent critique of the socio-political and religious institutions of 8th century BCE Israel and its failure of ethical responsibility. Amos condemns systems that allow the wealthy to luxuriate while the poor wither. In addition, Amos is critical of worship that is devoid of the promotion of social justice in the world. And our reading today is the third in a cycle of seven visions of Amos between Amos and God. In the first two visions, they are so bad that Amos intercedes on behalf of the people asking God to forgive their waywardness. However, in this third vision, Amos delivers only the message of justice and destruction. In fact, the object Amos identifies as a plumb line is anak in Hebrew, which literally is translated as tin or steel. We all know that tin, steel, iron are impermeable surfaces, so think of Anak as a hidden reference to God's steely resolve to cut the people off. I will never again pass them by, God declares. It is clear the divine is exceedingly displeased with the people who have time and time and time again broken covenant with God. And God is offended. And this time, God has drawn a boundary, a needed marker, a plumb line, and is done. It is clear the God of the universe is deeply offended and angered. Now I know this is one of those parts in the Old Testament that makes all of us uncomfortable. How can a loving, merciful, forgiving, understanding divine threaten to disown, to disown no, destroy their beloved people forever? In spite of their avarice, in spite of their addictions to power, to comfort, to status quo at the expense of the poor and the disenfranchised, in spite of being called to accountability over and over again and refusing to change, still, shouldn't God's mercy rise above? God of all beings should be able to tolerate the mistakes and unbridled, heartless behavior of Israel because God is perfect love. And yet, perfect love 
is also tough love, the kind of love that offers a measured boundary of a plumb line, which offers a chance for change, an opportunity for the kind of living that is centered on covenant and community rather than on self-interest and self-will. However, lest you think this is a cold-hearted deity bent on destroying and getting rid of all of the bad people, Biblical scholar Elna Solvang offers a deeper reading of the phrase, I will never again pass them by, suggesting this message of, Zoom, of doom is not easy for God to deliver. Passing by is a form of the Hebrew verb abar, which literally means passing over. And so when God says, I will not abar Israel, means that God will not pass over Israel with forgiveness. It means, as we find out later in the narrative, the total destruction of the northern kingdom of Israel's worship sites and complete demise of its government. Associating, associating passing by or not passing by with forgiveness of the holy is found elsewhere in the prophetic teachings of the Hebrew Bible. But Solvang reminds us that this same verb, abar, is used in Exodus with the wandering band of escaped Hebrew slaves in the desert, whom this same God claims as beloved and names as chosen. God has showered holy favor and intimate relationship upon them. Moses, in fact, witnesses the passing by of the glorious presence of God on the mountaintop. And guess what Hebrew word is used in that account? Abar. Here, passing by signals the inmost presence of God literally close to Moses. It is this deep presence of God that will be cut off by never again passing by the people in Amos. In short, devastation and death is the result of the absence of God. So, it's complicated, it's layered. God is not a capricious being in Amos, but rather a God of relationship and of love and mercy who longs over and over for her people to live in justice. This is a God who offers a way to measure up a reflection of what it means to live close to the presence of the holy rather than far away and absent. Professor Solvang writes, the judgment Amos declares can awaken us present day hearers to God's intimate and persistent presence in our lives. This text also calls us to examine our willingness or unwillingness to live lives reflecting deliverance and mercy. I will place a plumb line in the midst of my people is really a gift. The holy plumb line in our midst reveals to us how upright, how centered, how grounded, and how true we choose or choose not to be. In my reading this week, I came across an image of a plumb line in modern art. In the High Museum of Art in Atlanta, an ink and charcoal drawing hangs. It is by the American artist Charles White. The drawing is called the Birmingham Totem, and it was created in response to the bombing of Birmingham's 16th 
Street Baptist Church in the 1960s. In the work, a young African-American boy, his head and body covered by a blanket, sits atop a pile of rubble from the bombed out church. From his right hand, a plumb line hangs down in front of the wreckage. I am setting a plumb line in the midst of my people. I think of the plumb line dropped before us today, my friends as church, church with a big C. What is the church's mission in a world ravaged by all kinds of devastation in so much need of attention and mercy? And what is our covenant in the midst of our fears of instability, of not having enough, of not being enough, of not being in sync with the status quo. And I think of us at First Congregational as a local church. We are a vibrant and multi-abled body of people, many of us not as spry as we used to, but still acutely aware of our unique call as a progressive people of faith. What is the holy plumb line in which we might use to measure ourselves as we regather and reconnect and revision and reconcile anew after the hardship of a pandemic? You know, there's a concept floating around religious circles. It is called consumer church. Consumer church is church where people think of as a place of consumption. These are some sentences you might hear in consumer church. I have to have brilliant sermons or it's not for me. I have to have amazing worship that makes me feel good all the time, or it's not for me. I have to be noticed and fed and be appreciated for what I give, especially my opinion, or it's not for me. Consumer churches, if I don't like it, then I can pack up my toys and go home. These marks of consumer church can be dangerous plumb lines of measures, measurement because the church, as I understand it, does not exist for itself or for its own self-pleasure, but it exists as an agent of God's grace. The point of church is to be transformed and challenged as disciples and followers of the way of Jesus to focus on giving and serving and yes, sacrificing for justice and mercy. It means getting out of ourselves and offering what we have to feed others. It's not about us. It means, to paraphrase Frederick Buechner, being aware of the greatest needs around us, taking stock of our own gifts and passions and resources that can be used to meet some of those needs. It takes community and covenant to believe that Everyone is doing their best, wanting to row in the same direction. It means standing closer together and risking to know one another. Maybe that's our plumb line for now as a community. Maybe our plumb line is to stand closer together. On her Facebook page, Sheila Clendenning posted these words from Elder Stephen Charleston of the Choctaw Nation and retired Episcopalian Bishop of Alaska. He wrote, Come, 
Stand closer now. Come and stand together. The struggle for tomorrow continues. The issues are many. The resources are few. We need one another, all of us who share the vision of a free and fair future. We will not attain it alone. It will not be birthed easily or sustained easily. Justice takes work. Hope takes courage. We need one another. We need the strength of our combined wisdom and the passion of our shared commitment. Trusting in the spirit, reaching out to every culture and every tradition, we will prevail because we will not conquer. We will refuse to conquer. We will refuse the ancient temptation to power. And in so doing, begin a new chapter of hope for every story ever told by those who long for peace. Come, stand closer now. Friends, this is our plumb line. Come and let us stand closer now. Amen. We come now to a time of prayer. And on this day, we especially remember all the people impacted by the tragedy in Surfside, Florida. We remember the families that are grieving and struggling, and we remember all the frontline workers. In addition to this difficult situation, we also invite you to lift up now your prayers of concern for yourself, for others, for our country, and for our world. Let us pray. Loving God, hear our prayer. And may we know, even in this very moment, that God is with us, and ultimately, all shall be well. Amen. And so as you go out into this day, look for the plumb lines that offer a measure of justice, peace, and mercy 
stand together with those with whom you are in community so that we all might be a part of God's dream for this world. Go in peace and return in love. Amen.